Hi, Alison Tandry of DIY Salvation here again to bring you the third installment in my lecture series on the resolution of the mind, also known as TROM. While I try to make every presentation something that someone new to TROM would be able to understand, as I progress through this series further and cover more advanced TROM concepts, this will simply not be possible. But it won't take long for you to catch up. Just go to our channel DIY Salvation and select the playlist Alice in Tandry's Trom Lectures and listen to the first two before engaging this one. If you still find my lectures hard to follow, then go to the beginner's playlist. In the first lecture, I introduced the subject of postulates. In the second lecture, I covered what a false identification is. Remember, a postulate is a desire, purpose, or goal. You could substitute the word intention, and it would serve just as well. You intend something, you postulate something, it's basically the same thing. In the second lecture, I talked about what a false identification is. It's identifying one thing as another, as in the example of the man who is afraid of dogs, because he identifies every dog he sees as the one that attacked him as a child. But a false identification can also be the consideration that two things are of equal importance when they actually aren't, and that's what I am covering in today's presentation. The four basic postulates are to know, to not know, to be known, and to not be known. When we have a postulate such as to know divided up into its four manifestations in this way, we call it a goals package. Each manifestation is called a leg of that package. Now of course, there are goals you can form into packages other than the one of to know. After all, when you see an apple, you don't just want to know it. You want to eat that apple. Of course knowing the apple is part of eating it, but your goal in this case is to eat, even though the goal of eating, as well as other goals, still involves knowing, not knowing, being known, and not being known. The goals package for eating is to eat, to not eat, to be eaten, to not be eaten. You can take other subjects like love or help and form them into goals packages the same way. To love. To not love. To be loved. To not be loved. Or, to help, to not help, the be helped and to not be helped. If you listened to the first lecture and said to yourself, wait a minute, there has to be something more to life than just knowing and not knowing and so on, you wouldn't be the first to think that. But even the goals of to eat, to help, and to love all have elements of knowing, not knowing, being known and not being known in them. Those three goals are just more specific, but that's all. Every desire and intention you have belongs in the basic goals package of to know. Another aspect of postulates is that every postulate has a twin. When you are postulating to know something, you are at the same time postulating that thing to be known. When you postulate to not know something, you postulate that other thing to not be known. And it works the other way around. You could postulate that you want to be known, and therefore are postulating one or more entities to know you, and if you want to be not known, or in simpler terms, don't want to be known, then you are postulating that others not know you. The postulate you make for yourself is called the self-determined postulate. The postulate you want the other to take on as a result of this postulate is called the pan-determined postulate. In Dennis Stevens's book when he says that games end when your opponent takes on your pan-determined postulate, what this means is that you have successfully made your opponent postulate what you are postulating, but from his point of view. If you want to be known, you win the game by making your opponent know you. Your opponent wins the game if he can successfully not know you, and drives you into the postulate of to not be known. In the video How Advanced Level Trom Handles Inner Conflicts and Past Overwhelms, also on this channel, this game of must be known versus must not know was illustrated by a process server trying to serve a summons to a man who stayed inside, refusing to come to the door to accept it. The process server wants his documents to be known to the man sitting in his home, and he wants the man to know those documents. The man wants to not know the documents, and wishes the process server not be known to him. A game is a contest of conviction. Your conviction is your postulate, and you try to convince the other of your postulate so he has that same conviction you do. 
When you communicate with someone, you want to be known to them, and they to know you, and they in turn want to be known to you, and you to know them. This is a complementary postulate situation. The postulates each person is making complements the other person's postulates, and there is no game. Only if the conversation turns into an argument do we have any sort of game. If it's just a debate between the two about different beliefs ending with them agreeing to disagree on a matter, we could say that this is a voluntary game. But if it becomes a shouting match where the two are insulting each other's convictions, and each other, then the game has become compulsive. You could compare a voluntary game with a compulsive game simply by saying the voluntary is less serious and the compulsive is more serious and those would be workable definitions. But there are precise phenomena that separate the two and I'll explain this more in depth. Let's take a voluntary games player who is operating on the postulate of to be known. That person wants you to know them. But they are also willing to know you. They want to be known, and they are willing for you to be known, if that's what you want. But a compulsive games player operates differently. He will postulate to be known, but he doesn't want to know you. Or maybe he doesn't want to be known, but still wants to know you. The man who talks non-stop but never lets you speak is in a compulsive game state. The spy who wants to find out the enemy's secrets but doesn't want to be discovered is also playing a compulsive game. A classic example of a compulsive game played with the to no goals package is the beautiful woman who wants the attention of every man in the room, yet ignores all of them. Then there's the quiet, shy type who does not want any attention drawn to herself, yet watches people and may even eavesdrop on their conversations. These examples are also given in Mary Tandry's Trom Talk videos on this channel, which apply basic Trom concepts to dating sex and relationships and are well worth watching if you need a visual aid of how these games play out. When one makes a postulate but at the same time is trying to prevent you from succeeding in that same postulate, we call that postulate that prevents you an exclusion postulate. When I force you to know me, but I prevent you from being known, my postulate is to be known, and the exclusion postulate is to not know. I don't want you to be known. Only I can be known. I am trying to keep you from winning at the same game I am playing. If you were to not know me and force me to know you, that would be a losing situation for me. See how this is different from communication or voluntary games play? The compulsive games player, in this case, has only two postulates they want to operate on. It's acceptable for you to know them and not be known to them. The other two postulates of them knowing you and you being known to them are not. If there's an argument, and I am sure you may have heard this before, that the purpose of an argument is to make the other person stop talking, you have the perfect example of both people engaging in this compulsive game, each of them wanting to be known while not knowing the other. In these compulsive games, one is seeking to overwhelm their opponent, as opposed to forming agreements like in communication, or changing the other's mind via a friendly debate, which would be a voluntary game. Now that we know about exclusion postulates and more about compulsive games, we can address the subject of vengeance as well. As I mentioned before, other, lesser goals than to know can be formed into goals packages with four manifestations, or legs, as we call them in TROM. In the goal, to attack we have as its four legs, to attack, to not attack, to be attacked, and to not be attacked. Have you ever wondered why when you are attacked your immediate impulse is to attack the other person back? When someone attacks you, they postulate to attack. But at the same time, they are postulating to not be attacked. Well, when someone forces you into this game, your postulate is going to be to not be attacked. And how do you accomplish this? By attacking, of course. But why? It's because now both of you are postulating to attack and the exclusion postulate is to not be attacked. When the beautiful woman who wants every man's attention postulates to be known but also postulates to not know, those postulates become of equal importance in her mind. It's just as important to her that you know her as it is for you to be not known to her. Similarly, in the situation where you are attacked, the postulate of to not be attacked immediately becomes just as important to you as your postulate to attack. The beautiful woman believes to be known equals to not know, and to know equals to not be known. 
She thinks if she starts knowing others, she won't be known to them. And in the case of a fight, one believes if they don't attack the other, they will be attacked, so they have to attack the other to prevent the other from attacking them again. In other words, to attack equals to not be attacked, and to not attack equals to be attacked. What I'm talking about here is the other kind of false identification mentioned in the previous lecture, equating two postulates that are in fact not equal. There is no absolute truth to be found when someone postulates they have to not know others in order to be known, or to attack others in order to keep from being attacked. The beautiful woman isn't really keeping herself from being known if she starts to know others, and there are other ways to prevent attacks other than attacking. Yet there are people who operate this way. They make the exclusion postulates, they falsely identify or equate their postulate with that exclusion postulate, and they wind up in a compulsive condition regarding life rather than a more cooperative one as in communication, or a more playful one, as in voluntary games. If you are listening to this and say to yourself, hey, that's me. I have false identifications that lead me to play compulsive games, don't feel bad. The majority of us on planet Earth are compulsive games players to some degree or another. If at this point you are still having trouble comprehending what I'm talking about, then consider this, in war, the worst kind of compulsive game man can play, the soldier knows that on the battlefield it's kill or be killed. Think about the postulates involved there, and you'll begin to grasp the flavor of what I'm saying. The advanced levels of trauma are specifically designed to get you out of these compulsive conditions, with these compulsive computations, playing these compulsive games. Let's review what time-breaking is. It's the simultaneous viewing of the past and the present for the purpose of diminishing the importance of the past. On level 2, you do this by noting differences and similarities between a past object and one in the present. At level 3, you discharge the impact of full events by experiencing them while being aware of your present surroundings. These two levels of trauma in themselves will diminish your compulsions to play games in life, and at the end of level 3, you are now a voluntary games player. On levels 4 and 5, the advanced levels, you work with the postulates, the conflicts, and the overwhelms. Whereas on levels 2 and 3 you are selecting what objects, persons, or events to time break, on levels 4 and 5 you are examining postulates, conflicts, and overwhelms to stimulate your mind to produce more incidents to time break. On level 4, Holding the idea of a postulate overwhelm in your mind produces times where that overwhelm occurred, and then you time break such out of your mind. On level 5, you do a similar activity, holding a postulate in your mind while also holding your opponent's postulate outside of you which will stimulate times you've been overwhelmed, overwhelmed others, or had conflicts. Once again, you time break anything that shows up. When you get a moment, I recommend you watch the video time breaking the illusion of time explained and then right after it watch how advanced level Trom handles inner conflicts and past overwhelms so you can actually see how this all works. These exercises are done in a particular order with different combinations of postulates in order to clean up your past conflicts and overwhelms in the most efficient manner. And it's terribly important to make sure you've done the previous levels first and follow the instructions for levels 4 and 5 precisely once you get there. I can't say it enough times, don't try trauma exercises based solely on our theory presentations. You'd be playing with fire if you did. I do realize that in this and the first two lectures I have only covered trauma levels 2 through 5, and haven't even touched on level 1 yet. There's a reason for that, which you'll understand when you listen to my next lecture in this series, which talks about level 1 of trauma, what it is how it came about and why it is absolutely necessary to achieve the results of the rest of the TROM program. Thanks for tuning in and staying with us as we continue to cover TROM theory in this lecture series. I'm Alison Tandry. We are DIY Salvation. Don't just use your mind. Resolve it.